In my last video, I created an input buffer for my breadboard computer that lets me paste in a whole program like this. And even though I'm pasting in the characters of the program faster than the computer can process them, they all get buffered and processed and the program works. But the input buffer is only 256 bytes long. If I paste in this longer program, you can see it misses a lot of it. And that's because characters are arriving faster than the computer can process them, and the buffer can absorb some of that, but no matter how big the buffer is, if characters keep arriving faster than the computer can process them, eventually the buffer is going to fill up and start overwriting data. So just making the buffer bigger won't work. Instead, when the buffer becomes full, we need to have some way to tell the sender to pause sending for a moment while the computer processes what it's already received. You know, then once the buffer empties out a bit, we can tell the sender to continue. But how do we do that? Well, here's our RS-232 interface, and you can see we're using transmit data, receive data, and ground. But what about all these other pins? Well, one of them is precisely what we need to solve this problem, which is uh, this one labeled CTS, which is clear to send. And that provides a way for the hardware here to signal that it's ready to receive data, or in other words, the other end is clear to send data. So if I connect this pin to ground, that'll tell my laptop that it's not clear to send data, and so it shouldn't send anything yet because the hardware here is not ready to receive yet. And so now if I try typing here, well, nothing's changed. And that's because right now we're actually ignoring that CTS line. But if I go to settings here in my terminal program, I have the option here for RTS CTS flow control. So now if we turn that on, that now says we're going to be paying attention to that clear to send signal. Now if I type, nothing seems to happen. But actually something did happen. My computer knows that I typed stuff, but it hasn't sent it yet because it's respecting this clear to send signal that's saying it's not okay to send yet. As soon as I connect this signal to a positive voltage, boom, now it sends everything I typed. And as this setting here would indicate, this mechanism is known as flow control because it allows the receiver to control the flow of data to the sender. And it's RTS-CTS because it's using the, well, we're using the CTS signal anyway. The RTS signal would be for data in the opposite direction. But in our case here, the issue of one of these computers sending data faster than the other can process is uh, not really a problem in the other direction. And I should note that even though this is called RTS-CTS here in the terminal program, and it's labeled RTS here, RTS means request to send, which is not at all what this signal is. It's really a ready for receiving signal. And so technically it should be called RFR. In fact, if we look at the latest version of the RS-232 standard, here are all the pins for the standard 25 pin connector. And a lot of these are historical and no one uses them for anything anymore. Uh, but here pin five is clear to send, and pin four is request to send, or ready for receiving. And there's a note here that says that when hardware flow control is required, circuit CA, which is RTS, may take on the functionality of circuit CJ, which is RFR. So everyone calls this RTS because back in the day it was the RTS pin, but in any modern implementation, it's, it's really RFR. And you know, by modern, I mean in the last 40 years. And so an RFR actually makes sense for a symmetrical connection. You know, just like one side's transmitted data becomes the other side's received data, if one side says it's ready for receiving, that means the other side is clear to send. You know, but everyone still calls this RTS, um, so that's what I'll call it. But, but now you'll know that I'm technically wrong when I do. But anyway, we've got this clear to send signal that we can use to tell the transmitter to pause. But how do we control it to tell the transmitter to pause once the receive buffer is full? Well, the UART we're using has RTS and CTS pins just for this purpose. Uh, pin 8 is RTS, which of course really means ready for receiving, and the B in RTSB, RTS bar, um, means it's inverted. So actually we need to run this signal through an inverter. And conveniently, we've got this MAX232 chip here, which in addition to shifting the voltages to comply with the RS-232 spec, also happens to be an inverter. In fact, it's got two transmit inverters and two receive inverters, and we're currently only using one transmit and one receive. So we could use the second transmit inverter uh, to invert and level adjust our RTS signal. And so the T2 in is pin 10. So let's connect uh, pin eight from the 6551 UART, which is the RTSB signal, to pin 10 then on the MAX 232. And then uh, T2 out, the output of that inverter is pin seven. So we can connect the CTS signal going to my laptop to pin 7. And so now our UART RTS, which it really means ready for receiving, is properly connected to the clear to send signal on my laptop. So when the UART is ready to receive, it tells my laptop it's clear to send. And the way we use it to do that is the command register. Uh, bits 2 and 3 are the transmitter interrupt control. And if we keep bit 2 at 0, then transmit interrupts are disabled, 
And then bit three controls whether RTSB is high or low. And so since we're inverting it, setting bit three to a zero means we're not ready for receiving, and setting bit three to one means that we are ready to receive. So we look at the BIOS code, here's the interrupt handler. You know, every time we receive a new character, this interrupt handler gets called. And so we read a character here, and we write it to our input buffer. Now what we want to do is check to see if the buffer is full, and then if it is, turn off that ready to receive or clear to send bit. So we can call the buffer size routine, and that's going to return with, you know, however many bytes are currently in the buffer will be in the A register. Then we can compare that to FF hex, and if it's less than FF, that is the buffer is less than completely full, then the compare is going to leave the carry flag clear. So we can branch if carry clear to not full, which will just be right here, and that'll then just return from the interrupt. Otherwise, we'll continue in here and load A with 1, and then store A to the command register. And by storing a 1 like this to the command register, bit 3 is going to be off, so that'll end up deasserting the clear to send signal on the transmitter so that it won't transmit any more data now that the buffer is full. But this actually isn't exactly what we want. If we wait until the buffer is completely full like this before we tell the sender to stop sending, it might have actually already sent a couple more bytes. So really, we'd be better off telling the transmitter to stop a little bit earlier, say, you know, when the buffer is greater than or equal to, uh, like, F0. Uh, then we'll uh, deassert the clear to send, and if a few extra bytes trickle in, um, we've got some extra room here in the buffer for those. So that should work. Once the buffer gets almost full, it'll stop the uh, sender from sending anything. But of course, once the buffer starts to empty out, we need to re-enable that clear to send signal to tell the transmitter it's okay to resume sending. So up here in our character in routine, this is where we read a character out of the buffer. And once we do that, we can again check to see what the buffer size is. So here we're reading from the buffer, echoing that character out, and now let's check again what the buffer size is. Then we want to check to see if the buff buffer is empty so we can turn on the clear to send again. But we don't actually necessarily need to wait until the buffer is completely empty to turn clear to send back on. You know, we could maybe wait until the buffer is like half full, um, you know, or maybe two thirds full, something like that. And so if the buffer size is more than B0, uh, the carry flag will be set. So we can say branch of carry set to uh, say mostly full. And so if the, if the buffer is still mostly full, then we'll just carry on here like normal. But if it's less than mostly full, then we'll drop in here and re-enable the clear to send. So we can load A09, which turns bit three back on, and write that to the command register. So that re-enables the ready for receiving signal, so the transmitter will continue transmitting now that there's some room in the buffer. Although we need to be careful here because this routine is supposed to return the character that was read out of the buffer in the A register. And so we're reading, um, we're reading that character into the A register here in read buffer, we're echoing it out, but then the rest of this code here is clobbering the A register. So we either need to, we could push A onto the stack here and pull it off the stack down here so we don't lose uh, that, that value that we read. And that way, when this routine returns, it'll return with the key that was pressed in the A register. We could also do this buffer size check before we read the character. I guess that would be another way of doing it, but, but this ought to work. So let's save that, rebuild our ROM image, and then write that to our EEPROM. So once that's done, I'll put the ROM back in the computer and reset it. And then to run basic, we want address 8000, and then R to run. Okay, so now if we paste in that big program, it actually looks like it still didn't work quite right. Um, but if we do a list here, you can see it actually did uh, read it in properly. It, it's all there. And of course we can run it, and it, so it looks like our input routine is actually working error-free in terms of the input. It's just for some reason, when we paste in, it's not echoing properly. And I'm not exactly sure why that is. And you can really see that if I paste in a larger program. So here's a much larger program that I'll paste in here. And you know maybe I'm missing something obvious here. I, I don't really understand why it doesn't echo correctly as it's pasting this in. You'll see you know, that it actually does receive this perfectly once it's done here. Uh, but for some reason, it just doesn't echo it correctly as it receives it. But now that it's in there, you know, if I list the program, 
And you can see, obviously, it, it was all entered correctly, and it has no trouble keeping up printing it out all correctly. And so that shows that the input routine, the input buffer, uh, input flow control, it's all working perfectly. You know, otherwise it wouldn't have this big long program in here perfectly. But I really actually don't know why it's not echoing correctly while the flow control is throttling the input. As far as I can tell, it's some sort of bug, um, actually hardware bug with the UART here. This is kind of a buggy UART, though I can't seem to find this particular bug documented anywhere. Um, but a way that I found to work around it is that rather than using the UART to assert RTS, um, the RTS pin, get rid of this and instead use just a random pin from the, the virtual interface adapter here, the, which is basically just a general purpose IO pin. And this signal is still gonna go through the max 232 to do the, the level shifting and everything. But so, so now this pin, we can just set it high or low to control the uh, RTS signal. And remember the max 232 is also an inverter. So we wanna set this low to say that we're ready for receiving. And we wanna set it high to say that we're not ready for receiving and we, we want the sender to pause. Then when we first start up, say, you know, here where we initialize the input buffer, we want to set that pin low, which means we're ready to receive. So we can load A0 and store A to port A. We also need to make sure that the first bit of port A is set to be an output pin. So first we can load A01 to set that last bit and store A to DDRA, the data direction register, which will set the first bit, bit zero, to be output. And then the rest will be input, though we aren't really using them, so it doesn't really matter. Then I guess we need to define port A and DDRA. Um, so we can do that up at the top here. Port A is physically at address 6001. And if any of this is confusing, I've done a lot more with the VIA chip in previous videos. And then uh, DDRA is at address 6003. So now in the IRQ handler here, where um, the buffer is almost full, instead of telling the UART to clear RTS, uh, we want to just set bit zero of port A to one. So instead here, we'll load A uh, zero one, and then we'll store A to port A. Then up in our character in routine, when the buffer is no longer mostly full, we want to toggle that same bit back to zero. So instead of telling the UART to set RTS, we'll load A with zero, and then store that to port A. So let's save that, reassemble it, and write it to the EEPROM. So now I've got that running, so let's jump into basic here. And now if I take a longer program, so I'll take this program and paste it in. Look at that, the flow control works flawlessly. So it didn't drop anything and you know, we can run the program, of course it works fine. I can even paste in that really long program and you can see this is going much better than before. So it seems like there was some sort of bug in the UART where toggling the RTS line works correctly as far as controlling the rate of characters into the buffer. So, you know, like you saw before, the flow control part of it seemed to work fine. But for some reason, while it's doing that, it garbles the echoed characters um, that, are, that are going in the opposite direction. So it's kind of an odd bug, but it's gotta be a bug in the UART hardware since um, bypassing the RTS circuit you know, that's, that's in the UART and just implementing it ourselves seems to fix the problem. And now you can see it seems to read and echo flawlessly and this entire program here is pasted in without any issues. So if anyone knows more about this particular issue, you know, please let me know in the comments. In the meantime, I think I'm gonna play some classic Hunt the Wumpus. I don't need instructions. All right, we're in room 10. Let's move to room two. Ooh. Got pretty lucky, so I smell a wumpus. So that means the wumpus is in one of the adjacent rooms. I just came from room 10. So the wumpus is in either room one or three, but there are bats in the other room. So let me retreat back to room 10 and see if I can figure out which of rooms one or three the wumpus is in. Let me go to room nine. Oh, bats nearby. Let's retreat back to 10. Now let's try 11. Okay, we're in 11. Let's go to room 12. Aha, room 12, we smell the wumpus again. So room three has gotta be where the wumpus is because we smelled him before up here and he was in, we were in room two, we came from room 10, so he was in either room one or three. Now we're in room 12, we're next to room three, we can smell him, so we're gonna shoot into room three. Aha, you got the wumpus.